it brings harmony, law and order, and it liberates a person from slavery to money, slavery to power, but makes him the servant of God and the friend of God. I thank you very much for your patience, for listening, and I think that there is uh, time now for some questions. I'll be very happy to take your questions or your queries. Thank you very much. Uh, Arab world only. There is no mention of messengers of any part, any other part of the world, like India, China, Africa, etc. Similarly, four holy books are um, they pertain Arabia. Why, please uh, be specific. The Quran has generally mentioned that prophets came to all people. It says, for every people a guide came. Immin ummatin illa khala fiha nazir. There is not any community except a warner, a reminder came among them. So it generally it is recognized. But the Quran was addressed first to the people who spoke Arabic and who understood what was going on. Quran is not an encyclopedia on religion. It, is, uh, it does not put all the names of all the prophets. There were 180,000 prophets, and if the names of all the prophets were given, and all the explanation given about all the prophets, it will be a cumbersome book. It will become like an encyclopedia. So the purpose of the Quran is to present certain principles, and those principles can be explained and elaborated by Muslims. And that's why you'll find that examples are given from the local, from the limited, from the culture that was available to the people. So that people can understand the first addressees of the Quran, those who were addressed by the Quran first, those were the Arab people, and they knew what was going on in that area, because they used to travel sometimes to Syria, sometimes to Yemen and all those areas. So they were aware of what was going on, and that's why those prophets are mentioned who were their common knowledge about whom they knew something. Because the Quran speaks about people in China and they had never traveled in China. They even have difficulty in pronouncing those words, those names. But it is, the general principle is recognized. The Quran says in one place, there were prophets whom we send. Some of them we have mentioned to you by name and some of them we have not. Some of them whose stories we have told you and some of them whose stories we have not told you. It means God Almighty is speaking to the prophet that there are some whose stories we have not told you. But that means a, a principle is recognized and that's why later Muslim writers and Muslim historians, they recognize that. And people said, yes, those people, great teachers who came in other lands, we uh, cannot say definitely that they were prophets of God, but it is possible that they were prophets of God. So we cannot say about Buddha whether he was prophet of God or not. Maybe he was prophet, maybe he was not, but we cannot be specific because the Quran has not mentioned him by name. Or Lao Tzu, or number of other great leaders, we cannot say about them, but probably they were. It all depends on their message and how that message is. But we can be specific about those 25 prophets whose names are mentioned in the Quran. Uh, in fact, uh, some people have, recently I was reading a, a work that is uh, being done in India where somebody has mentioned that uh, uh, Noah is the prophet whose message is, uh, who is considered as a universal prophet and there are some references to that and one can say reading from the Hindu scripture and this person has done a specific study of the Hindu scripture and tries to find out in the Hindu scripture certain similarities and certain references which he said that uh, can, be, uh, uh, can be put with the Quranic message. It's a, a person's attempt and there were a number of other attempts that were done several centuries ago. So it's possible one can do that, this kind of research. Generally Muslims recognize this principle that God's message came and this message is not only limited to the Middle East but it is there in every continent, in all people. We study the religions of Africa, or religions of America, or religions of the aborigines of Australia, and we do find certain divine principles there. 
where from those principles came, where from that, that spirit of goodness, the righteousness that you will find there, it must be from the divine inspiration that, that was received by those people. Can a Muslim man have more than one wife at a time? Can a Muslim woman have more than one husband at one time? A Muslim man is allowed to marry uh, more than one wife, but not more than four at a time. A Muslim woman is not allowed to marry anyone except one man at a time. She is divorced, husband dies, she becomes a widow, then she can marry another person. But uh, in the life of when she is married to one person, she cannot have another husband. Uh, it is not because of any, uh, I mean, spiritually or uh, recognizing that men and women are, women are less uh, perfect or men are superior to women. It's not because of that. It is recognizing certain biological issues certain biological issues, recognizing that, and also recognizing the progeny that is the children who will be born from this marriage. These are the considerations because of that Islam has not allowed. Now as far as the man is allowed, a man that he is given the permission, he, it is not, Islam is not urging men to have more than one wife, is only giving them a permission. So it is only a permission. In fact, there are reasons by because of which we can say that there are a lot of restrictions to this permission also. So it's not like an open permission. You can just have as many wives as you want, and uh, second wife, third wife, fourth wife. But there have to be reasons, and then if you marry, then they have to, you have to fulfill certain conditions, certain responsibilities. And then, and then only it will be allowed, otherwise it will be a sin to have the second wife or third wife if one is not fulfilling those conditions. But in the case of women, of course, as I said, it is not allowed because of certain biological reasons and other limitations. As much as life is sacred, how could Muslims afford trading humans regardless of their religious attributes, uh, affiliations for economic rewards? Reference Asian slave trade from Africa to Arabia. The, quite often you, you will read in the Western literature that it was the Arabs who were involved in the slave trade. In fact, it was not the Arabs who were involved in the slave trade. Quite often it was the Western nations themselves they were involved and they are the ones who did most of the slave trade. But some Arabs, some Muslims were involved. Not to the extent of what the Western press, Western writers say. Some of them did that and uh, wherever they were involved we do not in any way uh, apologize for that. We simply say that it is wrong because it's not Islamic. Islam does not say that you take a free person and sell him. The Prophet, peace be upon him, uh, and in, in fact uh, it was the second caliph, once he heard that uh, the governor of Egypt, his son, hit a common person on the street, thinking that he is the son of the governor, and there was a very famous statement which has become part of the Islamic literature and Islamic history. He said that since when you have made people slaves when their mothers have given them birth free, it means every child is born free, and how can you enslave somebody who is born free? So it is not allowed in Islam to enslave some, a free person. And if Muslims ever did that, and sometimes they did, it, is, it was a sin. It was wrong. It is not allowed in Islam to do that. How can you say there is no ethnic struggle in Islam? Sunni and Shiite factions are killing each other in Lebanon. Are black Muslims following uh, 
Louis Farrakhan, true to Islam, his rhetoric differs markedly from you. I think the part of the previous question was, how does Sunni Muslims differ from Shiite Muslims in their interpretation of the Quran? Uh, the difference between the Sunnis and the Shias are not ethnic because the Shias belong to different ethnic groups. There are, out of the total Muslim population, about 10% of them or little less than 10% are Shias. 90% of the Muslims are Sunnis. So Sunni and Shia are not ethnic differences, they are more uh, sectarian differences. So these are the two major sects in Islam. Just as you have in, in Christianity, Catholics and Protestants. You have among Buddhists, Mahayanas and Hinayanas. You have among Jews, Orthodox and Reform. You have among Hindus, Vaishnavas and Shaivas. So various religions have their, these two polarities. One emphasizing one aspect, another emphasizing another aspect. So these are the two major groups of Muslims. Uh, one of them is about only 10%, the other is about 90%. There are, the difference came early in Islam, in the very first, first century of Islam. And it is, it came on the question of the successorship the authority in Islam. The Shias believe that uh, Prophet Muhammad, after his death, the leadership is in his family. And he had a daughter who was married to his uh, cousin, Ali. And from the marriage of Ali and Fatima, uh, the children Hassan and Hussein were born and from there they had other children. So they believe that uh, successorship is leadership in Ali and his family. That's why they were known as Shiat Ali, the party of Ali. Later the word Ali in the common usage dropped and they're known as Shias. They emphasize that uh, successorship, the leadership of the Muslim community must be in the family of the Prophet. They believe that there is some kind of a blood relationship. And the leader is someone who belongs through physical relationship, through the blood relationship to the Prophet. They emphasize that point. There is some kind of a charisma that descends from the Prophet through his blood line. And they believe that Prophet uh, designated in his own life all the leaders that are going to be the rulers of the Muslims until the end of the world. They believe that Ali was the successor of the Prophet and after that Ali's son Hassan and then after that Hussein and then in his family his son and then his son and his son until they go to the twelfth Imam. The twelfth Imam is believed that he has disappeared and so he is in occultation. He is known as Imam Ghaib, hidden Imam. And he is the leader of the world. Since the time, the third century, he disappeared until now and until the end of the world. And everybody is expecting him. He may appear at any time. And so it is kind of a messianic expectation. And they believe that in the absence of the Imam, in the occultation of the Imam, somebody is speaking on behalf of the Imam. So the Mujtahid or the Ayatollahs, they speak on behalf of the Imam, the hidden Imam. And that hidden Imam is from the family of the Prophet. Now this philosophy is not recognized by the Sunnis. Sunnis emphasize that Prophet was a human being. He was divinely charged. He was, the message was given to him. God revealed to him the Quran and he also gave his guidance. So whosoever follows the Prophet's line, Prophet's guidance, that person, if he is accepted by the community to be the leader, will become the leader of the people. So they believe that after the Prophet's death, Abu Bakr became the leader by the choice of the people. And Prophet left this thing to the community. The community itself has to select their leaders through consultation. 
So there is no appointment from above, but rather there is a selection and democratic process and election of the leader that must be there. And this is what majority of the Muslims uh, recognize and follow. So there is no uh, mystery in terms of the imamat, in terms of the, uh, the leadership, but it is uh, on clear principles, that is the principles of the Quran and the Sunnah. So this is the major difference. Now you'll find that basic uh, issues which I talked about, the unique, the oneness of God, the prophethood of Muhammad, the recognition of the Quran, the five daily prayers, the pilgrimage to Mecca, these are basically the same. Sunnis and Shi'is recognize both of these things. And uh, quite often, both communities live together. Sometimes the, the clashes that you find, they are not uh, more religious, they are more polit polit political type. And uh, political groups, they try to exploit those kind of uh, religious differences. And uh, that's how the killing and unfortunate incidents that are taking place or the war that took place between Iran and Iraq, it came, it is not based on the religious rivalries, it is more on the political issues and political problems. Otherwise, both, both, both communities have lived side by side with each other, even though they differ with each other, but they live with each other and still in many countries they are living together and they pray together, in fact. The second question was the black Muslims following Louis Farah Khan. Uh, the black, uh, this movement of black Muslims started very early in America and it represents the racial, racialism that existed here in this society, anti-black feelings. So uh, to, to revolt against that, Alija Muhammad and before him some other people, they spoke against it and they said that uh, Islam is the message for the black man and Islam came to liberate the black man and uh, in this their rhetoric was little strong anti-white. So they spoke very strongly against the whites which is not Islamic position but it reflects the condition, the situation in which the message was presented. Now when in 1975 Elijah Muhammad died, his son Wallace Muhammad, may Allah bless him and give him long life, uh, he corrected a lot of those things and brought the community back to the right path, to the real Islam, to the true Islam, not having extreme positions or rhetoric which is anti-white or anti this or anti that, but he said we have to go back to the true Islamic message. And before him, of course, Malcolm X was doing the same thing, for which he was unfortunately killed. And uh, now you will find that a large number of Afro-Americans in America, uh, they, have, they are following Wallace Muhammad's message. And they have left that kind of Alija Muhammad's uh, rhetoric, even though they respect him for whatever he did in terms of introducing them to Islam, but they don't accept that whole philosophy. However, Louis Farah Khan sticks to that, and there are a few people with him. And we hope that uh, they will also realize the truth and they will come to that true message of Islam, but that does not represent the true message, unfortunately. Uh, whatever he is saying in terms of that rhetoric, anti-white rhetoric or black supremacy ideals, those do not represent the true message of Islam. And uh, the true message is what Wallace Muhammad is presenting. And we hope that with more study, with more knowledge, with more education, uh, there will be better understanding. Do Muslims believe that God answers prayers and intervenes in human affairs? Yes, certainly, God uh, answers our prayers and uh, we must pray to God because there are various things that, there are, very, there are many factors that, that work in this world. Some of them we understand, some of them we don't. One of them is the factor of, uh, of causality, the factor of cause and effect. That means everything that you have to do this and then you will, the result will come that way. 
and uh, you must do that you must recognize the causality you must not you must understand all the causes so that you can work according to that and see the results but not everything depends not totally causality is not the ultimate thing there is also god who is in charge of of the affairs of the world and that's why we pray to god so that various causes various elements that work together those work together in our favor in the best interest of us and we make that prayer and those prayers are answered those prayers happen is not by that that doesn't mean that god somehow interrupts the causality occasionally it happen when the miracles happen but generally god does not interrupt those causa- that causality but rather moves the causes so that the right thing can happen and you see that quite often quite often you see that that there are things you yourself say that it was a chance that i was saved you are driving on the freeway i don't know how you drive here in iowa but the way people drive in, in california i can tell you that uh, it's it's every day almost a miracle that people are saved and not more people die on the road than the number of people that die now people will come and tell you i was just saved i could have been involved in an accident it would have been terrible accident so there are sometimes the quite often we see that things things are there is something that is that that is happening here and uh, yes our prayers do make a, a, an effect and that's why prayer is so important it was said that main purpose of islam was to bring the human being in contact with the creator how is this accomplished what guarantee can islam give for hope in this world or the next can you support the claim that man is basically good who defines what is good these are heavy questions um god yes this is the purpose of islam to bring the human being in relation to god and islam does that through this whole process of religion worship the living according to the sharia following the example of the prophet this is what what brings you closer to god that is by living in this way you yourself experience a muslim does not experience god indirectly the real purpose of islam is that you experience god directly not through someone else but within yourself you pray to god as if you see him even though you see him not but he sees you that should be the experience a muslim as one of the uh sages of islam he said that he said a muslim is billahi wa min allahi wa ma allahi wa ila allah a muslim is with god from god uh moving towards god that is what a muslim's experience should be he is with god from god through god and moving towards god so islam if, uh, emphasizes this point very much the quran says in one place when my servant asked thee concerning me that means god is speaking to the prophet and said when my servant asked thee concerning me say i am near the question was where is god and the answer came from god say i am near now how near it all each person has to realize that for himself or herself this nearness is there this god could be very near to you in one of the sayings of the prophet the prophet said god says that when a person does the acts of righteousness he comes closer to me more and more until i become his hand until i become his eye until i become his ear 
That means God is very close to the person through the acts of goodness, through the acts of devotion and faith in God. So this is the whole Islamic purpose to bring that kind of realization and it's accomplished through the acts of worship, not through just by some kind of a claim. Because those who make this kind of phony claims, they are very much away from God. God gives guarantee. What guarantee can Islam give for hope in this world or the next? This, uh, this is very tangible guarantee that Islam gives. That guarantee is, here is the message, here are the rules, study them, use all your intelligence, your, your, your reason, your mind, see, find out and practice that and you will see. It happened to those who follow. A whole community of people, they followed this message and see what happened to them. And every day you see that yourself. There is nothing that Islam gives you which the human beings will say, that's not good. There is nothing that Islam forbids you and human being can say, that was good, it should have been allowed. Everything that is forbidden in Islam is not good for you. Everything that is allowed in Islam is good for the human being, individually as well as collectively. That is the hope that Islam gives here for this life and for the life to come. Can you support the claim that man is basically good? Who defines what is good? Evil does not continue. The nature of the evil is that it perishes. In al akana zahuqa. The continuation of the human life, the continuation of this world itself means that there is more good here in this world than there is evil. So I do not subscribe to the, to the philosophy that says there is more evil, there is more pain, there is more suffering in the world. Yes, there is pain, there is suffering in the world. It's true that sometimes the storms come, but they don't come every day. Most of the time we don't have storms. It is true, sometimes people go hungry, but majority of the people eat. It is true that sometimes we get sick, but most of the time we are healthy. So it is wrong to say that because there is sickness, because there is misfortune, there is difficulty, the whole world is miserable. This whole philosophy of suffering and the cause of suffering and this, the pain of suffering, this is, a, this is not a, a complete picture. It is half truth and half truth is not the truth. In fact, you will find that there is more goodness in the human beings and Islam wants to, 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 to raise this goodness in the human being. So there is a great confidence, there is optimism that Islam brings and that's what this optimism that we have to work on. Not, not being negative, not being pessimistic and say that there is no hope in the human being and someone has to come from above and have to save us. We are in the ditch and we have to be saved, we have to be pulled up from there. No, there is some goodness in us and this goodness has to be brought up. You have, it has to be raised up. And it is possible for you, for anyone who is in the difficulty, it is possible that you come out of that difficulty. You have to have some confidence within yourself. You have to develop within that your, and you can do it yourself. In spite of all the difficulties, all the problems that the environment and the society and all those things, the pressures that are put there, people do come out of those and change the society and bring challenge to those things and bring goodness to the people and good, bring goodness to the world. That is the optimism of Islam and that is an important aspect of Islamic teachings. Would you please explain more the word jihad because we have we have confusion about it. Well, basically I said that the word jihad means a struggle. And this struggle has various dimensions, various aspects. This struggle starts within yourself. 
that is you struggle against the evil inclinations saturn and saturn's uh, satanic forces they try to mislead a person mislead a human being so there has to be a constant jihad within oneself but these satanic forces also try to create evil and disorder in the society by by bringing injustice and disharmony between the human being destroying the economic justice in the world the quran says in one place that we sent the prophets that god sent his prophets so that people may live with justice this is the real purpose of divine messages so that people may live with justice and uh, injustice is created in different ways in the society and that's what is the whole cause of evil and there is a need for jihad a struggle for that sometimes this struggle is done through explanation through talking through persuasion through dialogue through writing sometimes you have to make a more active action sometimes you have to even be uh, take force in your hand and fight against the forces of evil because the forces of evil they try to dominate they try to take over and you have to fight with those forces but then when you fight those forces there are certain rules that are given there one of the important rules of islam is that is wherever you, it is possible to stop stop that whenever you can use some other methods some other means use those methods and those means it is the last resort it should be used with great care with great understanding and the second thing is you must not extend the military action beyond the combatants the non combatant should not be involved into that it's a very specific teaching of the prophet that do not fight those who do not fight you and mention that in the specific instructions abu bakr and umar and other great caliphs they gave specific instructions that do not burn the trees do not kill the children do not kill women do not uh, bother the monks and the priest people in the religious work do not bother them only those who combat with you combat with them and if they incline to peace incline to peace laud wana illa ala zalimin no aggression except against those who are the wrong doers so this is the basic purpose that means if it is to be done it is to be done with great care and non combatants innocent people they should not they should not be involved into that it is so unfortunate that modern weaponry modern arms were developed by people who did not belong to this philosophy who did not subscribe to the philosophy of islam if muslims would have been in the forefront they would not have developed this kind of armament this kind of uh, atomic bombs and nuclear bombs and all those kind of bombs and this is uh, this is very unfortunate uh, because these are just terror nothing more than that terrorizing and now people people of course talk about uh, the development of the nuclear bomb by the muslim nations also i think ideally muslims should not have that but the problem is that uh, there are nations that are keeping those if there is a universal ban on the nuclear we- weapons and nu- nuclear arm- armaments then muslims will be in the forefront of doing that in fact there isn't any nuclear weapons in the muslim world but some people talk about it simply they say because other people have what could we do but if there is a universal ban if everybody agrees to that then i think this this is the right thing islam is it is in the very spirit of islam that there should be total ban on the nuclear weapons on chemical ba- weapons on all other kind of weapons which involve the, the non combatants where from the suffering of the humanity comes and what iraq did in terms of using the chemical weapons against the kurdish people it shows that this is not the islamic way is is an islamic totally it's cruel what was done and uh, th- those weapons should be banned completely but they they should be banned 
everywhere, not just in, uh, in, in some countries, and other countries can keep on producing and selling and terrorizing the whole world in the name of keeping the balance of power. Could you please explain about what uh, written in Salman Rushdie's book? Do you think there are any true statements in that book? There is nothing in that book. This is the it is a most obscene book. It's the most filthy book uh, that is written. Although he claims to be its fiction, but even fiction has certain certain taste, certain standard. The man just gone total bananas. I mean, he's just a crazy person. I mean, he start doing all those kind of things and using that. And he, uh, it is so unfortunate that he did that. And there are respectable publishers who published that. That's what created anger among the Muslims. Well, if this person has written, maybe those kind of books some kind of, uh, some publisher whose books are limited to the X-rated areas will go there. But here is a respectable publisher, Penguin, who is putting this book on every library shelf, in every respectable bookshop. That kind of book, what will say people who do not have much knowledge of Islam? Quite often people, you see, people do not read fiction, just fiction. Otherwise, why if you have a, any, any film, or any stories that has racist slurs and statements, why those films, uh, people get angry with those films? They make protests. Because they know, even though it is a story, but this story might create some kind of impression into the mind of the people. And people say, no, it should not be done. Even in films, even in the stories, you should not have statements that create hatred and animosity towards the people. This book does that, that, that thing in a very, not only subtle way, but even very clear way. It does that. It creates hatred against the Muslim people, against their religion, and it disparages the whole history of the Muslim people. That's why it creates so much anger and so much protest against that. Both ways that what the author did and what the publisher did in terms of bringing that book and publicizing it in a large scale. That's why but there is nothing in this book that has any history, historical basis, all confusion of his own mind, jumbled dreams that he has. And he put those jumbled dreams as Islam. It's, it's, it's a confusion that he does. He pr presents history, but uh, he tries to avoid the responsibility of a historian. That is the thing, that he writes history, so-called history, tries to put a history of the Muslim people, and he made that certain claims in the, to, the, to the reporters in, in, in England and other places. When they asked him this question, he said that, he says, uh, well, uh, I thought, let, let us fantasize about that, because we do not want to, 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 cha to face that challenge, whether this happened or did not happen. So let us fantasize. And he's trying to fantasize the history. He's writing history, but doesn't want to take the responsibility of a historian. Sorry for uh, not answering many other questions, but as you can see, that the time is limited. But I, I'm sure that 